Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Philip Kassen from Dibingen, Germany. Philip is a board certified orthopedic surgeon specialized in shoulder and elbow surgery. He received his PhD in regenerative medicine at the University of Heidelberg in 2007 and was professor for experimental orthopedic surgery at the University of Dreddain during 2011 to 2013. Now he is partner in private practice in the Orthopedic Surgery Center to Indian and also associate professor at the University of Heidelberg, Germany. Philip was president of the German Shoulder and Elbow Congress in 2017 and is also a board member for the German Shoulder and Elbow Society and also the European Shoulder and Elbow Society. He has received several awards for his research and has published more than 100 peer reviewed articles in several textbooks with respect to shoulder and elbow surgery. So today, it's my great honor to bring back Professor Philip Kassen from Tübingen, Germany. Over to you, Philip. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's my pleasure to be with you again. And my talk today will about the principles of arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. I will do this in two parts. First part is a clinical part. So I share with you one patient that I had. He said that he cannot sleep because of shoulder pain, that he cannot lift his arm without pain and he has less force while lifting the arm. On the physical, he has reduced flexion to 150 degrees, reduced abduction to 140 degrees with pain and also external rotation and internal rotation is reduced. He has less force for abduction with four out of five, but drag wheel of force for internal and external rotation. The impingement tests are positive and he has some tenderness around the bicipital, bicipital groove and the major tubercle, but not around the AC joint. I brought you the AP view of the X-ray and you can see that he has no osteoarthritis. The humeral head is smooth Maybe he has some osteoarthritis at the AC joint, but this was not tender. Because of the reduced force for abduction, I ordered an MRI and I show with you the coron coronal view. You see here the humeral head, the glenoid, the supraspinatus muscle that becomes the tendon over here. And you see this gap filled with fluid. And this is representing the tendon rupture. So my first part is about tendon rupture and tendon healing. Why did this supraspinatus tendon rupture? Reason number one is biology. If you look at this arthroscopic image, you don't see much bleeding and you don't see many vessels around here. There's little perfusion and because of this, little regeneration potential. If you look at histology taken from this area, then you see bone and the collagen fibers attaching to it, but there are not many vessels around here. So this confirms the finding that the regeneration potential in this area is pretty low. You can compare this to this asphalt road com as compared to the, this field. It's practic practically impossible to grow anything here because you don't have the soil to grow anything. Reason number two are the biomechanics. In the shoulder, you have a big ball and a small glenoid and you need the muscles to balance this large head in the small glenoid. And you need a working force couple to have this happening. What's even more difficult is that you have this big deltoid muscle pulling up and the internal and external rotators that balance the shoulder and form this force couples have a much shallow force vector. 
So this may cause some impingement of this insertion site where usually the tendon rupture occurs. And this led to this impingement signed by near. This is shown here. If you look an, at an arthroscopic image, looking from posterior to the acromion and the undersurface of the acromion where the CA ligament inserts, you see this fraying. And this may be caused by this biomechanical impingement of the humeral head against the acromion. And this repetitive impingement and the tendon degeneration because of this little re uh, regeneration potential may cause this tendonitis and inflammation of the bursa. And if you have this fraying and you can continue walking on a frayed carpet, as you can see here, the fraying may increase. What are our treatment options? Of course, we have non-operative and operative treatment options. What should we do? Kuhn and his Moon group reported this study where they followed 400 patients and they treated them at the first step with physiotherapy. And 90% improved significantly and only 10% required an operation. And you could decide this within the first six weeks. So it's reasonable to start with non-operative treatment. And in my hands, this consists of physiotherapy, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And if the patient has severe pain, you can also do subacromial infiltration with local anesthesia, cortisone, and if you wish, hyaluronic acid. I also always give my patients this leaflet that you're welcome to download from my webpage, www.occtubingen.de downloads physiotherapy. And these are the main mm, exercises that I recommend. That's some uh, retraction of the scapula, pendulum exercises, strengthening of the scapula muscles, then exercises for the external rotation and scapular retraction. These two exercises often are too difficult for the patients, but the last exercise is very important to release the tendon from the neck. So it's good to start with these exercises every day, twice a day, 15 minutes. And I also give them some prescription from a, for a physiotherapist to show them these exercises. But you know, if you have fraying of, for example, the trousers, this may increase and look like this over time. The same is true for the tendon. Every second or every fourth tendon defect increase over time. And this might reflect the pain the patients have if they have pain longer than six weeks, maybe you should consider operative treatment. Good indications for an operations if the tendon has little retraction, as you can see here, if the length of the tendon is longer than 15 millimeters and the tendon has some scalloping. This because this made, might reflect some elasticity of the tendon. In this case, you have a pretty small tendon. It's pretty retracted. So this is uh, an indication that might not be too easy. An MRI is useful to decide whether the muscle still works. So I always order an MRI if that's not possible in CT scan to look whether there's fatty degeneration of the muscle. A healthy muscle looks like this in the T1 image in MRI. And if there's atrophy, the, the muscle decreases 
and this tangent you can lay on the spine and the coracoid doesn't cut the muscle anymore. And this is a, not a good sign. So you have different treatment options for rotator calf rupture. If the atrophy is less than the third degree, according to Tomaso, the acromial humeral distance is bigger than six millimeters. If there is not too much osteoarthritis, and you can reduce the tendon after release with little tension, you can proceed and do a refixation of the tendon to the bone. If this is not possible, you have also some treatment options. You can do non-operative treatment with physiotherapy. If that's not sufficient, you can do a tuberculoplasty arthroscopically. You could do muscle transfers, especially the active muscle transfers with latissimus, teres, or in the case of the subscap rupture of the pectoralis major. And if there's a lot of osteoarthritis in the shoulder, you can do also do an arthroplasty with, a, with reverse total shoulder. One problem is that there's a pretty high re-rupture rate after the refixation. And this might cause less force when the tendon is not healing to the bone. What are the risk factors? For a re-rupture. If you look at this respect, retrospective analysis with an MRI done five months after the operation, the re-rupture rate is 7%. And this was dependent on higher age, larger defect of the tendon, and fatty degeneration of the tendon. If you look at this meta-analysis of 400 55 studies, the healing rate was low with 60 to 88%. And there were 12 prognostic factors in four categories. Demographic, and it was good to be young and male. The clinical factors that were positive were high bone density, no diabetes mellitus, good range of motion, and no obesity. If the tendon rupture was small with little retraction, low fatty degeneration, if, and if there was a single tendon rupture, this also was favorable. And it was not good to have additional biceps and AC joint pathology. In this review, the healing was reduced in elderly patient, larger ruptures, and again, biceps and AC procedures and, and workers' compensation cases. Smoking also reduces your healing rate for more than 50%. So the high re-rupture rate is present and might cause less force for abduction, but still the patients report less pain even if the tendon hasn't healed to the bone. So in this first part, I like to summarize that the tendon healing depends on biology, biomechanics, a good indication, and of course, the operative procedure. And that's the next part of my talk. I'd like to tell you my tips and tricks how not to struggle with an arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. The evolution of an arthroscopic rotator cuff repair is that you usually start with the subacromial decompressions and arthroscopic bankard repairs. You proceed to single row rotator cuff repairs, then you do double row, nerve release maybe, and the highest level might be an arthroscopic Latache procedure. And as you can see, the learning curve is pretty shallow. I had the pleasure to work with Laurent Lafosse and Nancy in France and do a fellowship. And uh, learning from this expert helped me a lot to 
improve my learning curve. And I'd like to share my experience with you. These are the steps to success. Again, indication is very important. If you look in arthroscopy and the tendon has some fraying and delamination, that's not so good, but still you can pull on the tendon and see whether you can reduce the tendon. And it's very good to have a flexible tendon that doesn't have too much tension on it when you put it and pull it to the, to the bone. So it's a good indication if you have less, you don't have to use too much force to pull it to the lateral tubercle as you can see here. I'd recommend that you talk to your anesthesiologist and ask for an interscaline block because this reduces bleeding and makes your life better. And also it has been shown in systematic reviews that regional anesthesia is superior to systemic pain medication. And moreover, you protect your repair because you paralyze the supraspinatus muscle. It's good to have an arm traction because this opens up your subacromial space. You can use this very simple uh, traction or you can use this assist arm by several companies you can use to open up the subacromial space. Blood pressure is an issue. It's much easier because of less bleeding if the systolic blood pressure is below 100 and the pulse is regular. This might be much easier to have if you feed your anesthesiologist mm -hmm. and you're in good terms with him or her. Pretty useful is a pump with an out and inflow control and the feature to have intermittent increase of the pressure for 60 seconds, for example. So you can reduce the bleeding temporarily with this higher pressure. To add 1% of adrenaline also improved the site tremendously. But this might be a problem with cardiac ill patients. Now I show you the typical approaches. And you should never hesitate to, to do an approach if necessary. <coughs> there are some nerves you should keep in mind. The suprascapillaris nerve is important for the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus. And it crosses from anterior to posteriorly in the suprascapillar notch. Second nerve in the front is the muscul muscular cutaneous nerve that enters the conjoint tendon approximately six centimeters below the, cor below the coracoid tip. The axillary nerve passes from anterior to posteriorly in the area of the muscular uh, tendinous junction from anterior to posterior in the axillary pouch and might be in danger in this area. If you still stay lateral of the coracoid, you're pretty safe. So the viewing portals for small supraspinatus and subscapularis tears and biceps pathologies is from posterior. If you have bigger supraspinatus and infraspinatus tears and subscaps tears, it's better to look from lateral and this is also the portal to view if you do tendon or nerve releases. It's also very good to stick to a strategy. And I'd like to share my strategy. First, I look whether you, I can do the operation. That's meaning, is the tendon still flexible and reducible? Maybe it's not possible to, uh, to do a complete repair, but only a partial repair. Then if, it, if it's not very flexible, you can do a release that I'll show you in a second. Then you have to open up the bone a little bit, but you should avoid weakening the bone too much, but otherwise 
the, the anchors won't stay in the bone, but it's good to have some bleeding from the bone. You should reduce the bursa that uh, disturbs you while visualization. So you should reduce the bursa a little bit. Then you put in the anchors, you pass the sutures, sutures through the tendon, then you tie the knot and cut the sutures. So the tendon release is important to avoid the re-rupture rate, to reduce the re-rupture rate. And you can do this with this bunker rasp or to avoid bleeding with this coagulation devices you can see here. It's good to cut the coracohumeral ligament in this area and the, and the supra, uh, superior glenohumeral ligament and to uh, remove the adhesions of the tendon to the bone in the superior part. If you put in the anchors and you pull the tendon through the, the suture through the tendon, you always have this loop coming out from the, from the skin. And it's sometimes difficult to, to, to pull on the right end. If you pull on the red end, then you, then you will pull the, the suture out from the eyelet of the anchor. So you should always look at the eyelet of the anchor and pull on this end that it's not moving within the eyelet. So you can avoid this mistake. It's important to do some exercises also in these uh, models to get some, uh, get the right movement with your hands. So again, you can see the evolution of the arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. And I hope with my talk in orthopedic principles, you will have a steeper learning curve. Thank you very much for your attention. And Questions are welcome. Thank you, Philip, for that excellent presentation. And thank you for acknowledging orthopedic principles throughout. Just a few questions. Uh, what is the position that you prefer? Uh, is it uh, B chair or lateral? And are you concerned about uh, any cerebral hypoperfusion when in a B chair position? Yes, that's an issue. I ought to do all my arthroscopic procedures in beach chair, and that's no problem. But uh, the, the issue that you're talking about is the cerebral perfusion. And uh, that's the reason why you should not lower the blood pressure too much. You can measure the cerebral perfusion with some devices. So by doing this, you're on the safe side. But if you don't have these devices, you should not go too low, especially in patients with chronic hypertension, because in these patients, they need some blood pressure to have sustained perfusion in the head. Um, in these cases, it's always a little bit difficult to see sometimes if there's bleeding and the anesthesiologist is reluctant to lower the, the blood pressure too much. In this case, sometimes it's uh, useful to have this adrenaline in the, in the, in the fluid because this constricts the, uh, the vessels and reduces the bleeding. Thank you, Philip, for that. Uh, the other question is, uh, when do you decide that it is going to be difficult for an arthroscopic cuff and you think about a muscle transfer? I agree that the degree of retraction is one of the criteria, right? So how do you really plan it? In my hands, I decide beforehand, before I do an uh, tendon uh, transfer. I have the clinical exam. This should could be another talk about muscle transfer. So that's a very interesting topic. If you want to do a uh, muscle transfer, you still should have some active motion. So if you lift the arm, the the patient should be able to lift it himself, but with less force and with some pain. And if this possible, and I see in the MRI that the tendon 
is retracted too much, like to the glenoid, the patient is not too old, less than 65, and the muscle is atrophic, so even a partial uh, repair is not possible. Then I proceed with the tendon transfer. In some cases, I do a diagnostic arthroscopy beforehand to check in the case of a latissimus or teres major uh, transfer to see whether the subscap is still working because this is necessary to have a successful latissimus transfer. And, uh, but otherwise it's, I decide beforehand before I do a lat latissimus transfer because you have to talk about the consequences with the patient because the, the post-operative uh, regi regime is a little bit different to an arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. So the patient has to be ready to do it and he, he, should, he should want it and uh, he has to do a lot of work after the operation to train his muscles. In the case of an latissimus, he has to change from an internal to an external rotator. And this is a pretty long road. So I don't do it uh, in, in the case where I haven't talked about this uh, beforehand. Thank you, Philip, for that. Uh, the other question is, see, there are a couple of level one data that have emerged in the recent past saying that a mini open cuff repair would give similar outcomes as an arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. What is your take on that? That's true. I also did in prospective randomized studies exactly on this topic and my, my data also showed that it's pretty similar. In the first weeks, the arthroscopic rotator cuff repairs have less pain. I could show this in the visual analog scale, but uh, after six to 12 months, the, re the re results were the same, both clinically and in the re-rupture rate. But the arthroscopic repair is a kind of mega trend. And it's, you can compare it to uh, the electric, mobility. Everybody knows that it has some problems too. And maybe it's not the best solution, but everybody wants to have it now. And if you are trained in arthroscopic repair, it's even easier to do an arthroscopic repair and shorter. And it's of course, for the patient, they regard it as sexy and modern and everybody wants it. So it's a uh, there's a gap between evidence and what patients want. And I have to admit, I do 99% arthroscopic because for me, it's much easier and shorter. And so I don't, I rarely, very rarely do many open repairs. Thank you, Philip, for that. Just one last question before you wind up. Uh, how do you address the CA ligament? I mean, if I'm right, initially Nier proposed that the CA ligament is one of the primary contributors, right? So do you resect? How much of CA ligament do you resect? And how do you approach the acromion? Can you reduce the size of the thickness of the acromion from uh, arthroscopically? Well, you have to look at the x-ray before you uh, decide this because sometimes there's a large bony spur. It's not too often, but sometimes there's a bony spur that uh, you should remove that's within the CA ligament. And uh, I only do a uh, subacromial decompression if there's fraying of the CA ligament. If there's no fraying, I don't do a uh, subacromial decompression. But usually if there's a, a large bony spur, you see this fraying and I remove the CA ligament from the undersurface of the acromion and I usually remove around six to eight millimeters, starting from the lateral part of the acromion, and then I move medially, so I have a smooth surface. But there are level evidence, level one evidence, that uh, it doesn't make any difference if you do a rotator cuff repair, whether you re remove the, uh, the bony spur or not. But I know that most of the shoulder surgeons still do it because they have the feeling that it reduces stress and might uh, reduce the pain 
in the in the early phase of um, healing. But if you look at um, level one evidence, it doesn't make any difference. The main step of the operation is refixation of the tendon. Thank you, Philip. I think that's all the questions that we have for the session. Fantastic lecture, really, really good tips uh, for anyone who wants to do arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. Thank you very much for joining in. Thank you and stay healthy. Bye-bye. Goodbye.